Okay, so if you turn to chapter 8, this is about entropy. I know we have already spoken about entropy in the past. When I was talking about the heat engines, it was really a way to introduce entropy. We also touched upon the, um, the sort of the, the equation which is behind entropy from physics. So that was this equation. The difference between this chapter and the previous one is that the previous chapter was really about the use of entropy in a physical sense in the context of heat engines. This chapter will look at the equations that we would use for entropy in, in terms of calculation of entropy. For example, when it comes to the steam tables, you always had the, uh, the columns which would give you entropy, but you never use them. So in this chapter, we will, for example, cover those. We will also talk about how entropy will be calculated. We still might mention in passing what it really the significance of entropy is. By the way, if, you've not, if you have not covered yet, or if you have not gone to appendix, in appendix, um, there's a reading exercise, um, and there's, there's a part called additional examples to understand entropy and second law. I think I really suggest, if you are struggling to understand entropy, please go and read that two pages, and it's really gonna help you with some examples, including the, the coin, tossing the coin, which I sort of mentioned last time, also, in terms of, for example, talking about the molecules in a gas, uh, you know, when it comes to, to, to a box or container. And these sort of examples are the best way to understand what really entropy is. So, that's about that. Let's just get down to the equations. The first 15 minutes of this lecture might be a bit boring. I try to make it exciting as, as much as I can, you know, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. These are exciting stuff, but well, some of you might think differently. So, um, let's just start with this equation, entropy. That's, I, that's This is exactly what I said physicists would define entropy. So we've got this ridiculously low or small constant, which is the Boltzmann constant. And you can see it's a, it's a number in an order of 10 to the minus 23. Times W, and of course you might expect that W has to be a very large number, and it is, it's essentially the number of positions, the number of possibilities uh, that in a system molecules can arrange themselves. Remember I told you about the arrangement of you guys sitting in this room? Every time, every Monday or every Thursday we have a lecture, it's gonna be completely different. Except a few of you that I notice you stay the same seat every time. But you know, apart from, apart from that, you always sit in a random position. The chances of me coming to a lecture and seeing that all of you will sit on the one side of the, of the lecture is almost zero. So, W is a number of possibilities that molecules can arrange themselves in a system. Of course, it has to be very, very large. That, that just shows that the probability has some relevance to entropy. And we talked about that when I was talking about the, the coin and the heads and tails and stuff like that, if you remember. And we'll see more about that on this page. I've got this example here. And I, I want to talk about this W um, because we haven't talked about this um, a lot. And I want you to understand exactly what this W means. So look at the system. We've got two steps in the system. Step one is when you have two reservoirs. One is hot, the other one is cold. And as soon as you place these two reservoirs on, the, on either side of the system, what you can imagine is that you're gonna have that sort of temperature profile. If you could see the temperature gradient, that would be that sort of inclined curve. High temperature on the right-hand side, low temperature on the left-hand side. Now, let me just, okay, so this was a step one. Step two is to remove these two reservoirs and then insulate this, this system very quickly. So without you know, letting any time or any, any heat to lose or to be lost from the system, you would insulate the system. As you can imagine, after a certain amount of time, the temperature profile would look like this, a constant line. The system is not gonna have any temperature gradient across it, and it's gonna be constant temperature across the whole um, surface or the volume if it's three-dimensional. 
So this happens every day in lots of different examples. You know, um, take it. You know, for example, when you're cooking or something, or you think about engineering systems. This sort of example happens on a daily basis, and we just want to see what happens to the W and what happens to the entropy. I want, you to, I want you to think about the order. So I talked about order and related order and disorder to entropy. And I said, this order is really proportional to entropy. So if disorder is higher, entropy is higher, and vice versa. I want you to think about exam step one and step two. And I want you to think about in which one we would have higher order. So in which system, think about the molecules arrangements, which one, in which scenario, you would have higher level of order in the molecules? Would that be one or two? Who says one? Who says two? Okay, so you're mostly wrong because the first system actually has higher order. Why? Because if you think about higher energy molecules, most of them will be around here. If you think so, these are higher energy, um, high energy molecules. If you now, and of course on the left hand side, you're going to have lower energy molecules. Why? Because you are two, you've got two sources that are dictating to the molecules how to arrange, roughly. Obviously, they can't fix the arrangement, but you know, they would, the, the high order molecules would sort of go towards the right hand side and lower energy would go to the left hand side. That is not the case in, in here because when it comes to this case, because the temperature is, is constant across the, uh, the volume of the system, then there's no distinction between higher order or lower order molecules, which means you're going to have actually a high level of disorder. They can go around. There's nothing to force them to move on either side, <coughs> excuse me, on either side of, the, of the system. Therefore, Order of one will be higher than order two. And of course, one and two refers to this and this. What can we say about the energy? Well, the energy actually in both systems will be the same because by, the fa by removing these reservoirs and then insulating your system, you're theoretically, you're not letting any, any heat or any energy to be lost. Therefore, the energy in both systems will be the same. What about W? So, in terms of the number of possibilities and the number of arrangements, um, which one would have higher number of, or high value of W, or higher number of possibilities or arrangements? Would that be two or one? It would be two, right? And of course, when it comes to entropy, S2 will be higher than S1. So the entropy of the second system will be lower than the entropy of the first system. And I think this is probably opposite to what you would expect because you would think, well, now here something's going on, you've got temperature gradient, so potentially, you know, you should have higher entropy. And that's, that's not true. You can see why entropy is so different or so, sometimes so difficult to understand. Um, but here, with some of these examples and thinking about the arrangement and disorder, um, you can then try to understand what exactly entropy means. And why is it so important? Why is, you know, the second law is really about entropy. Why is it so important in thermodynamics? Because you can see that the energy, which is another important factor, is the same in both examples. So what could distinguish these two systems or these two scenarios? That's the entropy, which, which does that. Okay. So, we talked about entropy, um, and something which is interesting is that this example, which I, tell, I told you, is, this is not a very special case. This, is, this happens, as I said, thousands of times every day in, in the whole universe. In, in this country, in, in the whole world, in, in on, on Earth, in other planets, or whatever. And you think about it, that's why sometimes you hear that the, the entropy of the, of the universe is just constantly increasing. And one thing that you will read from the uh, reading exercise in appendix is that the end, and of, of course this is a bit um, difficult to explain, or sometimes it's a bit controversial, but 
there's something what we call heat death, which means that is the end of the universe. And that is when entropy reaches its maximum level, which means everything will be at the same temperature. Therefore, there's not going to be any more, the, you know, the entropy can't increase anymore. And therefore, nothing's going to happen. No system will, will operate anymore. It's just, I think it's a concept in physics which um, is, is quite fascinating. In engineering, we tend to think that that doesn't happen. And so let's not re go into details, but I think that is something which, uh, if you come across heat death, that really what, what it means. It relates to entropy and the fact that it continues, continues to increase. Okay, so let's get to the boring stuff now. Corollaries. As soon as you hear these, you say, oh God, not again. I know. There is, I'm not interested in, in proving or deriving some of these queries. What I'm, the reason why I go through these is because in order to understand, if I just tell you, take that, accept that, and then memorize it, there's no point, right? You want to understand why we say that for a system, for a cycle, delta Q over T would be less or equal to zero. And I'm going to explain very quickly what that means. This is called the, uh, the Clausius um, inequality. That's Clausius 4. Why did we start with Clausius 4? We already covered 1 and 2 in actually 1 and 2 and 3. Um, one to three, actually, we'll cover it in chapter seven. One and two were about heat engines, um, and three was about absolute temperature. Three was about uh, temperature scale, which, you know, you can define a temperature scale, which can be independent of the uh, um, thermometric uh, substance. So we, we covered that. And here we're going to be looking at four and five. So, what is this class's inequality? I'm going to start with this and the fact that whenever you're looking at this equation, you have to think about the heat engines, what we discussed and how we introduced heat engines in chapter seven. Remember we had a hot reservoir, we had the cold reservoir, we had the engine here, which could be a cycle on its own, it could be a power plant, it could be a refrigeration cycle, whatever that is. And you have the heat which comes from the hot reservoir to the engine is called Q1, and the heat dissipated from the engine to the cold reservoir is heat 2. And you've got also temperature T1 and T2 here as well. Okay, so the fact that you've got the in an integral here, and it says C, this is a cycle or a closed um, system. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to say is that based on the first law, we define that for a cycle, the change in, in Q or delta Q will be equal to delta W. Um, because for a cycle, the amount of, and that's actually in, I, in an ideal system, in equilibrium, the amount of heat that you provide will be equal to the amount of work that you take out of the system. So that's according to the first law. So what, what we say here is that just let's remember ourselves, remember that Q1 minus Q2, which is essentially delta Q, is equal to W, and that has to be positive. Why? Because Q1 is bigger than Q2, obviously because of the hot reservoir, cold reservoir arrangement. So it's going to be positive. I, instead of going through the analysis here, I prefer to show you something um, slightly quicker and maybe something easier to understand. So this is how I think about this. So the fact that we've got this integral of delta Q by temperature is equal or minus zero, that means two possibilities. Delta Q over T is less than zero, or delta Q over T is equal to zero. And I'm going to look at these two possibilities and, and potentially show you um, 
each separately. So in order to, let's just start with the, uh, the first one. That's actually easier. So I'm going to show you this here. Now, this is a situation where you have a reversible um, cycle or a, re a reversible heat engine. And this is where you would have an irreversible heat engine or cycle. And we'll see in a moment how that happens. Something about that equation is that I could write, so I can write this, delta Q over T is equal to Q1 minus Q2, T1, T2. The reason why I can, I can um, put T1 and T2 is because temperature T1 and T2 will be constant based on what we define in heat, en in heat engines. Something that we know is that in reversible heat engines, and this is what we covered in chapter seven as well, is that because there are no losses when you have a reversible heat engine, Q1 over Q2, uh, sorry, Q1 over T1 will be equal to Q2 over T2 because of no losses. Excuse my handwriting, it's not the best. And, and this, this is actually quite easy to, to um, prove that Q1 by T1 is equal to Q2 by T2, and simply that results in that delta Q over T being equal to zero for reversible cycles. So if you have proved this one, let's just see if you can prove this one as well. And if you do, then we've shown what uh, corollary four really means. Okay, so this one, so I'm, I'm now showing the first one now. So delta Q over T is less than zero. And because this is a, uh, uh, an irreversible cycle, that means that Q1 T1 minus Q2 T2 should essentially be less than zero. The fact, we know something. We know that work for irreversible cycle, Wi, has to be less than the W are reversible. Of course, because in the reversible cycle, you don't have any losses, and therefore the work that you get out of the heat engine should be higher than Wi. If that is the case, I can write Q1 minus Q2 um, I, if you like, which is the irreversible, has to be less than Q1 minus Q2 reversible. The fact is, because these two are equal to each other, um, so what we can do, this Q1 and Q2, so we also know that Q1 I is equal to Q1 reversible. So these two will disappear. And as a result, you end up with the fact that because this, this actually is satisfied now, we know that Q1 minus, uh, divided by T1 has to be less than zero because of, of the, uh, the difference between Q2i and Q2r. So in order to reach that conclusion, I've used the equivalent of W and 
you know, the difference between Q1 and Q2, which would result in, in the amount of work. You either can follow this analysis here, or what is actually written in your, in your book. That essentially, they're, they're, they're the same, it's just a different angle, really. And I think I, 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 this is actually a bit easier to understand. Now, if you are thinking whether this is going to be assessed uh, in the exam, the answer is no. Uh, but it's really for you to understand the differences between, um, you know, the link between quality four and heat engines and how that refers to our, uh, the definition of entropy. If you go back to page 8.4 now, there is a quicker or an alternative way of defining this, and it's this actually, which is instead of using Q and W, you could actually potentially use the efficiency, eta, for I, which is irreversible, and comparing it to the efficiency of the reversible cycle and noting that this is going to be less or equal to uh, the reversible cycle. And from there, you can actually prove that as well. It's a very wet, quick way of doing it, uh, but now it makes a lot of sense because we've already done the other uh, long way. Something to note here is that the temperatures that we used in, in here, T1, T2, etc., these are the working fluid, the temperatures which are applied to the working fluid. These are not the temperatures of the reservoirs. So I think that it's important to distinguish these two, even though it doesn't really make a distinction in, in the classes inequality. Even though for a reversible engine, that doesn't really matter because the temperature of the working fluid and the temperature of the reservoir uh, are essentially the same. But there's a difference when it comes to irrevers irreversible cycle. Okay, so that's quality four. Quality five is slightly easier to understand and to demonstrate. This is about showing that entropy is a uh, property. That's all this quality is, is really about. It has a lot of sim similarity to... Um, some work that we did in chapter three on the first law. And I think we actually use the same PV diagram in the first, uh, when, when I was talking about the first law and when I was introducing a cycle and a property and stuff like that. This is going to be pretty much the same. All I'm going to say is that imagine that you've got point one, point two, you've got root A and B, and you've got root A and C. And we're going to be looking at some um, very simple equations applying to, to this. The first thing is to note that because it's a cycle, I can apply certain amounts of Q, Q12 for example, to curve A, and that has to be equal to the amount of, um, for example, work that you take away from this, W21. If you're not sure about this, then um, see page, um, I think that that's uh, probably see chapter three. And when we were talking about the first law, and the fact that delta Q minus delta W was equal to zero for a cycle. That's the starting point here. So, if I'm looking at the uh, if I'm looking at the first root, which was this root here, a b, that is what I'm going to get based on priority four. We just established that. We established that for a reversible cycle you will have delta QR divided by T is going to be equal to zero, or if you want to be more generic, then it's going to be equal or less than zero. If I now start 
if I now essentially, so in this case, means Q is equal, is bigger actually than zero. So you're supplying some heat to the cycle. As you can see here, I'm adding some Q. Therefore, if I'm looking at this cycle, it's quality, quality four actually is, is applicable. If I now reverse this process, <coughs> if I'm reversing this process, so I'm actually going B A, then this sign is actually reversed. Okay. There's only one possibility that that could be true. That's, that's only if that is equal to zero. So we, 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 this is essentially a verification of priority four, which we already shown. Now, this is a bit which is slightly easier because it looks at these two cycles. I'm again applying at AB and then looking at AC. So this is AB, this is AC. And I'm applying this equation to both roots, if you like. You appreciate that these two cancel each other out, and you're left with that being equal to this. And based on what we said <coughs> in chapter three, if, it might be easier if I explain through here, if you've got two points, and regardless of which route you take, you have, you end up in the same endpoints, then that has to be a property. So by the fact that this two are equal to each other, regardless of the root, that shows that this has got to be an entropy. That fraction, delta Q by T, has to be a quantity, a, a, a property, and this is exactly what we define entropy as. So entropy was really defined um, back in 1865, and we're going to be using this equation, or in this format, a lot. So the whole reason why we've been going through this query four and five was to show you why we would end up with this equation. Entropy will be Q divided by temperature. So you have the total entropy and you have the specific entropy, depending on whether you divide by mass or not, but that's, you know, you already know that anyway. And what I'm gonna do now, I'm going to look at two examples. This, is, this makes more sense now. We got the, the boring parts out of the way, hopefully. And I'm gonna be looking at that equation and see how we can apply that to a real problem. So we've got a, um, a cylinder and this is a uh, isobaric process. Remember isobaric was when the, the pressure in the system didn't change. Okay, so as you can see, we've got three stages. In each stage, pressure is fixed at two bar. If you want to look at this type of um, process on a, um, on a PV diagram, um, or essentially just a, you know, I want to, I'm interested in, um, in showing this on, on a, it could be even a TS, but what it shows, I want, to sort of, I want you to have some mental picture of what exactly, what steps we are going through. So if you imagine step one, two, and then three, this is TV diagram. What happens is that, so we are now heating up this cylinder. There is a, uh, let's say there is a heat source. This is a candle or a fire or whatever that is. It's heating up this cylinder, it's heating up this, this gas, um, uh, sorry, um, H2O, steam. What happens is that water will first become saturated, so you get from here to here, with very small change in the volume, in the specific volume. Then, as you go through step two to step three, what happens is that water starts evaporating and expands. Therefore, the volume increases and it pushes up the, uh, the piston up. 
and until you actually reach the um, saturated steam line of 0.3. So going back to some of the equations that we learned in the first law, you've all seen this equation, you use it a lot, and you saw that delta W could be written as PDV whenever you have any displaced work. Whenever you have a piston in a cylinder or something, or that sort of arrangement, that is how you write your, your work. Pressure DV. What you can do now, we also showed that by grouping U and PV, we end up with something quite useful, which was entropy. Remember that? This is the definition of entropy, U plus PV. And then I'm now trying to relate the equation which we defined for entropy, so ds equals delta qr divided by t, and we also showed earlier in some of the, uh, the previous chapters, we also showed that you could write, I mean this is actually you, you see, dq will be equal to dh, assuming that you have a reversible supply of heat from a reservoir of infinitesimally small, infinitesim infinitesimal higher temperature. So look at this image here. I'm assuming now that the amount of temperature, or the amount of heat which is coming from that um, heat source is at temperature plus delta T, or dt. This is what I refer as infinitesimal higher temperature. This is just an assumption to make this work, really. So, rearrange that equation, I get Q equals TDS, and I know that that has to be equal to entropy. You've all seen this equation in the past. This is, um, we've used this whenever you have a constant pressure process. In this case, actually, is the case. You've got isobaric. So, CP is the heat capacity at constant pressure. And that allows me to define entropy in terms of Cp dt over t by a simple rearrangement of this equation. If I start integrating this equation, of course, because you've got delta dt over t, you get ln, ln t2, t1. If you're looking at stage one to stage two, I'm now only looking at process one and two now. If you start inserting the numbers here, we know what T1 is, we know what T2 is, we know the value of Cp. If you start doing that and inserting the values there, you end up with the value of delta S, which is 1.53. Something interesting is that <clears throat> if you now go to your steam tables and start looking at pressure to bar for SF, which SF really is this point here, you see the same value which you just got um, in this example. So really the steam table is nothing but a tabulated um, list of scenarios and examples and, and values of pressure, temperature, etc. If I want to look at step two and three, it's quite similar. The difference really here is that my ds will be expressed as dh over t2. And by doing that, I can actually find out what is my delta, delta S in this case, which works out as 5.6 kilojoules per kilogram. Again, that is something which you can find in the steam tables. Just a reminder that this SG is referring to this point here, which is the saturated vapor line. Any questions so far? Okay. This just shows one example of, um, of this fundamental equation of, of DS with respect to Q and T, and essentially how this is related to the steam tables that you've used in the past. I'm going to do one more example, and we're going to stop. I think you've had enough for a Monday afternoon after Easter. 
I know. Believe me, when I was going through this, I was thinking, mm, how can I make this easier? There's, there's no other way. Um, it's just painful. But no pain, no gain, as you know. So, <laughs> Okay. I mean, from all these equations that, and derivations and all these minus, the, you know, this, that, multiplied by that, if there's one or two messages that you take away, I mean, that, that's what I want you to understand, okay? Um, you're not going to remember any of these derivations in, in I was going to say a few years, probably three months. Um, so the whole point, why we're doing this, is for you to have, to get some sort of understanding now, say, oh, right, it makes sense. And then that, oh right, that makes sense, sort of stays with you for a long time. And hopefully that, that happens, if you're still awake. Okay, um, so this example is slightly easier. And again, it shows why I said entropy of the universe is actually increasing. And you see actually very nicely why, why that is the case. Imagine you've got a copper block doesn't really matter, it's just a metal block uh, with a mass of one, uh, one kilogram and the heat capacity of C equals 0.4 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin and you just put it in a very large lake. Imagine that the temperature of the lake and that superscript L means lake is 300 Kelvin and the temperature of your block is 350 Kelvin. So there's almost about 50 um, Kelvin difference between the, the copper block and the lake. What happens is that, of course, T2, so at initial stage, you just drop this in, in the lake. What happens is that after a certain amount of time, of course, the lake is not going to heat up. Um, the, the copper block is going to lose its temperature and it's going to have the same temperature as the lake. The reason why we say a very large lake is just to ensure that the temperature doesn't really change in, in the lake. If this was a small vessel uh, or container, that would be different because that container would actually raise, the temperature of the container would, would increase. But in this case, it's not going to happen. So, <clears throat> and of course, you can imagine this is again a process which happens a lot uh, in the universe. So this just shows an example what happens in reality. Looking at the first law in the incremental form, this is the equation that you'll, you'll see. dq equals du, of course, because delta w is equal to zero. And that is equal to mc delta t. In case you are wondering where that equation comes from, um, so, just remember that delta Q was equal to CP DT, and that just means that delta capital Q should be M CP DT. And of course, CP was something that you would use when you have constant pressure, or you would use CV when you have constant volume. When it comes to a, uh, a problem like this, when you have a, 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 a for example, a, um, a block um, or a heat dissipation from an object, then we don't care about CP or CV, we just use C, which has the same physical meaning, but just a slightly different notation. Okay, so let's start with that equation again, what we derive as our um, entropy. This part of the analysis up to this point is for the block. We're just doing it first for the block and then we do it for the, for the lake. Okay, so that's the lake part and that is the block part. Because each would see the, the problem in the, from different view. So MC delta T, by the way, this has to be small c, I don't know why it's capital C. Just to confuse you, confuse you even more. So MC delta T is equal to 
delta qr, I could rearrange that equation, which I've just got from here, I could write it as tds. And because I'm interested in, in ds, I'm just going to rearrange the equation, and you're going to end up with mc dt over t. Whenever you have that sort of fraction, you know that when you do integration, you're going to end up with ln, right? You've got so many examples. You've seen that so many times, so that should be obvious by now. Once you integrate it, you get delta s on the left-hand side, mc are constant, and you've got ln t2 over t1. You insert the numbers. Of course, t2 for the block is going to be 300 because it's going to be at the same temperature as the lake. t1 was 350, and you end up with a negative number. Now, what does that mean? A negative change of entropy. So, that means S2 is actually less than S1. And 2 and 1 refers to the, to the time scale. So, at step, at, in time 2, for the block, the entropy was less than step 1. The reason why that is the case is because what happens is that molecules in the block would gain more order. So molecules in, in the block would gain more order as it cools down. Um, this is what we've seen actually in, in the past as well, because there's no, um, remember the first example that we started with today uh, in the lecture, when we were talk, talking about the two reservoirs, this is exactly the same thing. So this block actually would gain more order uh, as it cools down. If I want to now work out the heat exchange between the two, between the lake and the block, I just work out the temperature and I get about minus 20 kilojoules of heat, which is lost from the block to the lake. I'm going to now apply the same thing to the lake now. The equation is, is, is exactly the same. I just use superscript L just to indicate that. And what I know is that this Q here has to be proportionate to the amount of Q which has lost, which the block has lost. So what the block has lost will be gained by the lake, but just in the opposite direction. Therefore, that equation will be written in this form by adding this negative sign to indicate that exchange of heat. Therefore, your delta S is now going to be a positive value when it comes to um, when it comes to the lake. And what is the total change for entropy? That has to be the one for the block plus the one for the lake. And even though the entropy for the block was negative, the entropy for the lake was positive and it was actually higher. So the net change of entropy is actually going to be positive. Therefore, as a result of this simple action or process where you just, for example, drop something hot in, in the ocean or in the sea or whatever, you've raised the entropy of the universe by that margin. It's a small if you imagine that's, that happens over millions and millions and millions of years by billions of people, then this is actually why the, the entropy of the universe is just continuously increasing. And this is just one practical example in that. Any questions?